the Word of God. Many of us um, think that the things that Satan wants us to be ignorant of are um, things in the Bible that are really, really deep. I know there are some of you that may have problems understanding um, prophecy or being able to interpret the uh, parables. But in all honesty, the things that Satan really wants us to be ignorant of are the simple things that the Bible teaches. He knows that if we don't have a clear understanding of the simple things in the Bible, that we're not going to want to go further and to have a better understanding of the deeper things in the Bible that God speaks about. Amen. The spirit of prophecy says that we need to understand something about the scenes of Calvary, something that we're told we need to reflect on at least an hour a day. And that at the scene of Calvary, we should be weeping. And there's a reason. If we really, really understand what transpired at Calvary, we would have such a clear understanding of God's love for us that we wouldn't be able to hold back from crying and really, really having a heartfelt experience for what Christ did for us at that time and even now. Turn with me to John 8, and we're going to look at verse 44. He was waiting for them to just come to him so he could destroy them. 
they couldn't see how merciful God's love was and they believed. They believed all the lies that Lucifer had told them about God's character. Lucifer is still doing that same thing to this day. He's twisting God's word and making it hard for a lot of individuals to really see God's character for what it is, loving and kind and merciful and good. So the angels, they parlayed in third, going forth to God, and they failed to repent, and they were lost. The studied effort of Satan, it worked on the holy angels. Then he came to earth, and used the medium of a serpent. He spoke to Eve and distorted God's character once again. And unfallen beings of this world ended up falling because they again believed in the distortion that was presented to them of God's character. If sinless angels and sinless humanity, righteous beings, were deceived and fell because they misunderstood the character of God, you and I, are we righteous? No. Have we fallen away from the mark? Every day. So what would make us think that if we don't understand Satan's studied effort, that we would be okay. If it worked on sinless angels and it worked on sinless humanity, we have no reason to believe that we would be okay in our fallen state. So we really need to understand what God's true character is so that we can be okay. When the story is laid out time and time again, we don't even weep. And then there was a time when I remember first coming to the Adventist church and really, really hearing the story of Christ and his sufferings and how he gave up everything just for me. And I cried so much. It's been years since I've had that same experience again of God touching my heart and allowing me to really, really see what transpired on Calvary and understanding how much God gave up, how much God sacrificed, just as it was only going to be me that was saved out of billions of people on this earth. And I just repented and ask God's forgiveness for allowing Satan to blind me and to believe some of the lies because I think there are times where we all have a distortion of God's character. So when you look at Jeremiah 31.3, I want you guys to really understand what this verse is saying. The Lord had appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. The reason we don't come to God is because the love of God has been blinded from our eyes with a studied effort of saving. If these things would be dispelled by the true word of God, we would come to him. We're told that the cross is the means to move the world when you have a clear picture of what transpired there. That's how we to draw people to Christ. 
The cross will count with challenges and will finally vanquish every earthly and hellish power. In the cross, all influences centers and from it all influence goes forth. It is the great center of attraction, for on it, Christ gave up his life for the human race. This sacrifice was offered for the purpose of restoring man to his original perfection, yea more. It was offered to give him an entire transformation of character, making him more than a conqueror. Those who in the strength of Christ overcome the great enemy of God and man will occupy a position in the heavenly courts above angels who have never fallen. Do we understand that? The right that God is going to give us, the placement that he's going to give us of something that we really don't even deserve. Christ declares, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. And if the cross does not find an influence in its favor, it creates an influence. Where the heart is hardened, you look at individuals on the street, or in your church, or in your home, and you think that there's no way that they can ever be penetrated. If the cross does not find an influence in its favor, it creates one. Every individual, whether lost or saved, will have been influenced by the cross. But those who are lost have turned away. It doesn't mean that it won't come to them. But they will have to make an intelligent decision to turn away from the truth. Through generations succeeding generation, the truth for this time is revealed as present truth. Christ on the cross was the medium whereby mercy and truth met together, and righteousness and peace kissed each other. This is the means that is to move the world. Manuscripts 57, 1899. In every discourse, in every teaching, we are to see Jesus because he's there. We look at prophecy sometimes and we think, you know, there's these beasts, there's these timetables, there's all these different things. Where is the gospel in it? Where is Calvary in it? Where do we find Christ? But he's there in every single line of scripture. Christ is there. God has bound our hearts to him by unnumbered tokens in heaven and in earth. Through the things of nature and the deepest of tenderest earthly ties that human heart can know, he has sought to reveal himself to us. Yet these be, yet these but imperfectly represent his love. Though all these evidences had been given, the enemy of good blinded the minds of men so that they looked upon God with fear. They thought of him as a severe and unforgiving God. Satan led men to conceive of God as a being whose chief attribute is stern justice, one who is severe in judging, a harsh and exact creditor. He pictured the Creator as a being who was watching with jealous eyes to discern the errors and mistakes of men, that he may visit judgment upon them. It was to remove this dark shadow by revealing to the world the infinite love of God that Jesus came to live among men. It makes me think of the story of Luther before he began to read the New Testament and how he felt that he couldn't love a God who was so exacting that he felt that our destinies were already sealed. Why should I love a God who is just going to look at me as a sinful being and, and my destiny is already set and I'm just going to die and go to hell anyway? And then he found Christ the way that Christ needs to be revealed to us as he went through the New 
Testament, and he found love. He found the mercy of God, and it was opened up to him. If we are really honest, many of us have the view that God is a hard, very harsh and stern God. Suddenly, we think of these different things. Many of us, the only reason why we go to God in repentance, as we call it, is because we are afraid of hell's fire. And many of us, the reason that we want to be in heaven is not really because we want to see the face of God and to be embraced by his character, but because we want the golden streets. Many of us have the understanding that God is the way and Christ is somehow different. And that's not new because the Jews had the understanding about God that was imperfect. And that is why Jesus had to come so that he could show God's true character. Turn to John 1 and we'll look at verse 1. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That was everybody. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to hear witness, I'm sorry, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. There was the true light, which lighted every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Why didn't they receive him? Because he didn't come in the manner that they thought that he would come. They thought that he would come differently. They had an understanding of God that was different than what really appeared. And when we consider that, the reason why we don't receive Christ is because they didn't understand the things he had to do. And they didn't understand the prophecies that they preached every Sabbath. You and I are in the same condition as ancient Israel. Things that are preached every Sabbath, because we know him not, we will fulfill the very same prophecies that are preached and not on the right side of the equation we will end up being lost. The Bible says in 11, He came unto His own and His own received Him not, but as many as received Him, to Him gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In the book of Exodus, he turned 33. unto me, bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know 
and yet hast thou not known me, Philip. He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show me the Father? I want to take a look at Romans 1. Romans 1 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The Bible says that the gospel is the power of God. If someone were to ask you what is the power of God and how is it manifested, you would give them a Bible answer. The power of God is the gospel, and Paul makes it clear in 1 Corinthians 1.18. The only way a sinner's heart can be broken is by the power of the gospel. Many churches have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof because they have no real understanding of what the power of the gospel is. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which it is the power of God. The gospel is the power of God, correct? It's the power of God. What is the gospel? The gospel is the preaching of the cross.
also want to ask a second question along with that. Was the gift of Christ on Calvary, was it really a sacrifice? And I want you to really think about that. Was it really a sacrifice? The definition for a sacrifice, what does a sacrifice do? Like in the Bible, in the old scriptures, they, or Old Testament, they would throw something on some wood and they would burn it. Would it multiply or would it be consumed? Y'all can shout back at me. It would be consumed. <laughs> would be consumed. So, was Christ, Him coming to die for us, was it really a sacrifice? Because a sacrifice is not given to get something back from it. It's no different than knowing that if you had, let's say this week's paycheck, and you gave it to me because, you know, I'm asking you to give a sacrifice. But if you knew that tomorrow I was going to turn around and give you a million dollars, would you really consider that as a sacrifice? <laughs> no. You, I, don't, I wouldn't really consider it as a sacrifice. I'm going today without my check. But then tomorrow I'm going to get like a million bucks. So it doesn't really seem like it's a sacrifice. But we're going to see what the scripture says about it. How much does God know? He knows everything. The Father, the Spirit, and the Son, they know everything. They know all things. Turn to Revelation 13. We're going to look at verse 8. Revelation 13. We're looking at verse 8. Amen. When you're there, it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before God created, the plan of salvation was already laid. So in other words, you can say that Jesus has always been under the shadow of the cross. And if he knows all things, at what point in time did he know all things? Does God have a beginning? If you go back as far as in your finite mind to the beginning of everything that was ever created, God was there. And he knew for eternity that he was always going to be under the shadow of the cross. Because God knew everything. When we talk about the gospel, I want us to see what the gospel really entails. Turn to 1 Corinthians, and we're going to look at chapter 15 and verse 1. You know, I always have about flipping around. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which ye also, I'm sorry, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The plan of salvation then has always been 
When Moses began first writing, he knew about the death and the burial and the resurrection. The Old Testament is filled with nothing but symbols of Christ coming and dying. We know that God knows everything. And you can kind of say that sometimes you may be like in that kind of situation if you feel like, okay, you're on a job, I know how to do this. So maybe even before you get on a job and you're going for an interview, you say, well, I know how to do this. If you take, uh, for example, someone that is going to build a house, there's going to be the person that has, you know, the blueprint plan, and they're going to look at that, and they know just how everything is supposed to go, how everything is supposed to be laid out. Sometimes along the way, there may occur things, or I should say a different perspective, than what you thought was going to be there as you're building it even after you've gotten everything built. And I want to apply this to Christ and Him knowing everything. When we take a look in Luke 22, 39, looking in Gethsemane, when Jesus, and you can turn here while I'm talking, Luke 22, verse 39, when Jesus was 12 years old, and he was in the temple, and he saw the lamb being slain by the priest, it was at that time that he had realized what his mission was. And he stayed behind, and when Mary and Joseph left, it took them three days to find their son, Mary had confronted Jesus and asked, you know, son, you know, why have you, why have you done this? And he's like, you know, well, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And we know that he wasn't talking about Joseph, because Joseph was a carpenter. He was talking about his heavenly father. Jesus understood that he was to be the lamb that was slain. And all the scriptures that his mother Mary had taught him <coughs> began to come to his mind. He realized that he was to live, that he was to die, and that he was to be buried and then resurrected. Wouldn't we think, though, that he would have already known all of this even as a child? Didn't we say that God knows all things? But notice what transpires as we read 39. And he came out and went. And he went, I'm sorry, as he went to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that he answered not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and knelt down and prayed. The desire of ages, uh, when you read this, gives a very um, clear, descriptive understanding of what Christ went through when he was in the garden. It says that, you know, this was their, their place of going frequently to pray. But this time, when they went, the disciples noticed that Christ was a bit different. And the desire of ages speaks about how different he was. And when he went to his place, as he entered the garden, he began to swagger like a drunkard. And he went back and forth. And it was because of the woe and the anguish that he was coming under. The disciples had always gone with Christ 
to the place of prayer with him. And they noticed that he wasn't quite the same. When you look at verse 42, we see, because Christ didn't go down to the ground and pray the normal way, the desire of Jesus says how he fell upon his face when he went to pray. And he said, verse 42, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Why would Jesus, who for eternity knew the plan and had an understanding of what he was going to go through, come to this point and say, Father, if there is a plan B, if there's another way. Why would he, with his knowledge and all his understanding, from the beginning of time, through all eternity, <clears throat> now get to the place where it's coming upon him and he's having to go through this and face this thing that he's now saying, Father, if there be another way. But he said, nevertheless, not my will. In other words, Christ was saying, God, Dad, I know that this is what I have to do. But I'm getting to the place where it's about to happen. And I don't want to do it. I just, I, I need to know, please, is there another way? Is there another way that we can go through this and have the same outcome? Is there another way? Because if it's left up to me right now, I won't do it. I don't want to do it. But Father, I know that it's not my will. It's thy will that has to be done. Even the disciples did not understand what was transpiring. Could mortals view the amazement and sorrow of the angels as they watched in silent grief the Father celebrating his beams of light and love and glory from his Son, they would better understand how offensive sin is in his sight. As the Son of God in the Garden of Gethsemane bowed in the attitude of prayer, the agony of his spirit forced from his pores, sweat like drops of blood. It was here that the horror of the great darkness surrounded him. The sins of the world were upon him, and he was suffering in man's stead as a transgressor of his father's law. Here was the scene of temptation. The divine light of God was receding from his vision, and he was passing into the hands of the powers of darkness in the agony of his soul, he lay prostrate on the cold earth. He was realizing his father's frown. God, the father, and his son have always been one. And now was coming a place where they were being separated. Have you ever had an incident in your life where you do something that displeases someone, and not that they're angry at you, but they give you this look that just makes you feel so ashamed. And that was the look. That is what Christ was feeling happening to him. That he was feeling his father, who he knew loved him so much, was now frowning with disappointment. Thank you.
The cup of suffering was taken from the lips of guilty man and proposed to drink it himself and in its place give to man the cup of blessings. The wrath that would have fallen upon man was now falling upon Christ. This is an incredible transaction. It's so times very hard for us to really think about the all that was given up on our side. The cup of suffering Christ had taken from the lips of guilty men and proposed to drink for himself. This was in the garden. Christ was proposing and asking God if there be another way. As he felt the Father was withdrawing from him. Turn to Isaiah 59. We'll look at verse 1. Isaiah 59, verse 1. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. When you read that verse, do you really, really recognize now what is transpiring in the Garden of Gethsemane? All the sins of every last person ever to be born was now being placed on Christ. Someone who was so innocent. God was turning his face and Jesus was recognizing him. The light of his love and his countenance and his glory and mercy were withdrawn from Christ. And Christ kept saying, is there another way? When we look at Luke 22, 42, and he said to remove this cup from me, nevertheless my will, but thine will be done. In 43, when he says, and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. We're told that it gave down and he strengthened Christ to be able to drink the cup of death for every man. But what exactly did he place before Christ that gave him the strength that he needed to make it? Turn to Hebrews 12 and verse 2. Hebrews 12 and verse 2. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Joy was set before him so that he might be able to endure the cross. But the joy of what? What, what, what was the joy? It was the joy of seeing you, of seeing me, of seeing every last individual that accepted his sacrifice to be saved. I can imagine the angel being there and saying to him, you know, this has got to be hard. I can't imagine what you're going through. But you can't turn back now because Elijah, Elijah's in heaven. Moses is there. You took him. You resurrected him from death. Enoch, you just, you know, you didn't even want him to die. And then think of everybody now down through history. If you turn back now, they're all going to be lost. And Moses and 
Enoch and Elijah, they're going to have to leave heaven. Do you know how horrible that would be? Giving them a taste of something that they'll never have a chance to fully live out and experience. That, that's, you can't turn back now. You've got so much riding on you making it through. We know what happened, how Jesus was beat, how he was mocked, how his beard was pulled from his face, how he was scourged. And all of these things transpired and sometimes we do get caught up in the physical aspect of what Christ went through. Who's seen the passion? And it gives the Catholic view of what happened to Christ. And you wonder why that feeling, if you think back, when, and, and it was pretty vivid, I remember that movie, if you think back of just looking at the physical pain that Christ endured, it's no wonder why we lose so much when we think about the cross because that wasn't really where Christ was getting the pain from. The physical pain was nothing. What he was suffering, the weight of the sin of every last person, was the thing that was crushing him so much that his bodily pain could barely be felt. Can you imagine that? That's a lot of pressure. Matthew 27, 45 says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, Lama Shabbatane. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What does it mean to forsake? When you look up the word forsake, it means failed, quit, renounced, rejected, left alone. And Christ was saying to the Father and the Holy Spirit, why? Why have you left me? Why have you rejected me? What have I done? Why have you renounced me? Why have you failed me? We know that God the Father was there the whole time and he hid behind darkness. He looked at his son. And even Jesus' mother, in her heart, began to feel as though, you know, even now, Messiah in the question, was this really the Messiah? Even his own mother didn't really understand what was going on. She had a distorted view like the rest of the world. Matthew 27 and 46, when it says, Verse 48, and straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let, let me, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. When Jesus was there on the cross, the Bible describes him in a certain fashion. 
The Bible tells us that he became sin. The funny thing about being on the cross is that you're caught in between. Heaven doesn't want you and earth doesn't want you. You're totally alone. <coughs> 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And again, if you notice the transaction, we get sin taken from us and it gets placed on Christ and Christ becomes sin and we then get to become what Christ was, righteous. And now the Lord of glory was dying as a ransom for the race, and in yielding up his precious life, Christ was not upheld by triumphant glory. When the Bible speaks of the joy being placed before him that helped him to go through, the triumphant joy. Understand that it was really gloomy on the cross. Even though the joy had been laid before him. And he didn't want to do it. All was oppressive and gloomy. It was not the dread of death that weighed upon him. It was not the pain of the cross that caused his agony. Cross, Christ was the prince of sufferers, but his suffering was from a sense of the malignity of sin, a knowledge that through familiarity with evil, man had become blinded to its enormity. Christ saw how deep is the hold of sin upon the human heart. And how few would be willing to break from his power. He knew that without help from God, humanity must perish. And he saw multitudes perishing within reach. So he had to help. Upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. If you imagine all the guilt of everything that you've done and God allowing it to be placed on you at one time, you would go crazy. We would probably die. We wouldn't be able to take it. Upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgression that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. All his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father, the mercy and the pardoning love. Yet now he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. Can you imagine? Preaching how merciful God is, how loving God is, and then coming to the end and you not being able to see how merciful and loving God is yourself. Sometimes we have those moments. What happened to the promise of resurrection? He knew it all. He knew that he would be raised. But now he couldn't see because of all the darkness that was enshrouded around him. He couldn't see that he was actually going to make it. He couldn't see how the Father could ever turn back to him and love again. And still, he did not come off the cross. That's a sacrifice. He did not see how he would ever return. 
to the Father's love and still went through it. The joy was set before him. And even God, the Father, knowing that his son would get to this place, was still willing to let his son go. Sometimes, you know, like I said, I had a question and asked, why didn't God come and die himself? If you had a situation where you had a pool and somebody fell in the pool and they couldn't swim, you could swim. Your kid could swim. It's like really, really deep water or even the ocean. That's better because you got to fight against waves and current. And you yourself could go in and you could save the person with no problem. Just like your kid could go in and save the person with no problem. But would you rather go in yourself? We understand that Christ asked the Father, can I go? Is it okay? And God the Father allowed, permitted his son to go with the question of not giving anything back and losing Christ his son forever to the human race. That's a sound. When you have a being as Christ, never knowing sin, there was one thing that he didn't know out of everything that he knew, and that was sin. The only thing that Christ did not know. And he became sin for us. Christ went back to heaven after making it. The angels wanted to praise him and he had to stop them. Because he needed to see his father. He needed to make sure that what he did was acceptable. And he went to the father and he asked him. And God just looked at him and smiled. <laughs> 